Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning for those of you on the West Coast. Welcome to the Queen's International Institute on Social Policy. This is the 25th anniversary year of the Queen's International Institute on Social Policy. <clears throat> and I think it's fair to say that over the last two and a half decades, there's never been a period in which social policy is so intensely engaged with the contemporary policy debates. The pandemic has shone major light on the limitations of our income security system. And so the theme this year is whether we can forge a post-pandemic social consensus, a social contract that works for everyone. We are essentially asking in this uh, series of online panels <clears throat> whether Canada and other OECD countries can learn from the current context and can find a way through this crisis to build back better. To begin, however, uh, although we're not able to meet on the Queen's campus again this year, I would like to acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on the traditional lands of the Ashinaabe and <coughs> Haudenosaunee territory. We're very glad to be able to live and learn on these lands. This is the final week of our three week online conference. And this week builds on the first two. <clears throat> In the first week, we had a broad introduction to the post COVID or the COVID-19 world. We <clears throat> had a keynote speaker, we had a broad uh, scan across the OECD on the impact of the uh, virus and pandemic. And we <clears throat> looked at particularly groups who are vulnerable of being left behind in this context. In the second week, we drilled down into three areas, major policy areas, <clears throat> which are key to any post pandemic social contract, income security programs, social care, long term care and child care, especially, and protections for those in the labor market. And in that period, we had lots of ideas thrown up about good program initiatives that could help. <clears throat> this week, we sort of examine the question a little differently and we ask, what are the prospects for making progress? What are the prospects for building back better? <clears throat> Yesterday, we looked at that quintessential Canadian question, whether federal provincial relations can find a way to build back better. In today's session, we confront the question of the social contract head on. Our topic today is rethinking the social contract. The pandemic has highlighted fault lines in our society. Two fault lines in particular stand out. One is economic inequality. During the pandemic, we have seen that low wage workers in precarious work, especially in the service sector, have been hit very hard. <clears throat> they have been hit hard, both in terms of working in infectious contexts and in terms of wage loss <clears throat> or earnings loss. In contrast, the professional middle class has been able to largely work from the safety of their own homes and have not taken a big income hit. The second major fault line in our society that has been highlighted in the current context is racial inequality. We have seen how recent immigrants and racialized communities have been overrepresented in those low wage sectors which have been hit particularly hard. Many of the essential workers whom we have celebrated in recent weeks <clears throat> are from the racialized communities, especially raci <coughs> women in those racialized communities. As we saw in the presentation from Stats Canada in week one, in Canada, <coughs> this, the impact has been greatest among the Filipino, South Asian, Arab, West Asian, Black, and Korean communities. And other communities like the Chinese community, which <coughs> hasn't had as dramatic a economic impact, has felt a little uncomfortable in the way in which people have uh, referred to their possible involvement on, on, for, for no reason uh, in the spread of this particular disease. These two divisions, economic inequality and racial inequality are deeply related. But the calls for racial justice have also been triggered by the deaths 
<clears throat> black people at the hands of the police and have been mobilized by the Black Lives Matter movement. <clears throat> this movement has prompted a scholar's strike <clears throat> in recognition of anti-racism demands, a strike which is taking place in many universities <clears throat> today and tomorrow. Our participants have chosen to speak today because they believe that the debate we're engaged in here is fully consistent with the objectives of the scholars' strike. So today we ask, can we make progress on the twin inequalities highlighted by this pandemic? What are the sources of support for change? What are the barriers to change? Do we have an opportunity to rethink our social contract and to build back better? For this particular topic, we have three great <clears throat> presenters and speakers and contributors, and I'd like to ask them to join me now on the screen. Okay, welcome everyone. So <clears throat> our three speakers. Uh, I'll first introduce Irene Bloomrad. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Irene. Uh, <clears throat> Irene is the uh, Thomas Garden Barnes Chair of Canadian Studies at the University of Berkeley. She's also director of the Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative at Berkeley. <clears throat> Irene's uh, full bio is in your conference material and I will not uh, go through it uh, in detail. I'll simply say that Irene has been a leader in debates about citizenship, scholarship on the role of integration in contemporary societies cross-nationally, and particularly interested in the issues of immigration in the US and <clears throat> elsewhere. Our second speaker, or sorry, this is not the order they'll speak in, Next, uh, alphabetically, is Hugh Siegel. Hugh is currently the Matthews Fellow in Global Public Policy at Queen's University. <clears throat> Most of you will know Hugh. He's had a very distinguished and diverse career, <clears throat> both serving as advi senior advisor to a premier and a prime minister. Uh, he has served as president of the Institute for Research and Public Policy and uh, <clears throat> principal of Massey College. He also spent nine years uh, in the Senate of Canada. In the current context, Hugh has been a leading voice arguing for a basic income uh, as an important step in the evolution of our income security programs. Uh, and alphabetically again, the, our third speaker is Deborah Thompson, who is a newly arrived associate professor at, <clears throat> in political science at McGill University. Uh, Deborah spent the first part of her career at major universities in the United States, and she has been a scholar who's focused on uh, racism and the role of racial dynamics, both in the Canadian and international, oh, sorry, in the U.S. and international context. So I welcome all three of you. This is going to be a fascinating conversation. Uh, the order of speaking will be Hugh first, Deborah second, and Irene last. And I should warn uh, everyone that <clears throat> Irene is sitting in the middle of um, forest fires on all sides and uh, is subject to potential interruptions in her electricity. And so she may, her, that, that lovely face may disappear and we may only have her, her voice for parts of the conversation. So we've got our fingers crossed firmly here. Uh, before I start, <clears throat> I'm going to say that we have a slightly different format today. We're hoping to have a conversation, an armchair conversation, and therefore we're not going to have the normal pattern of stronger, fuller presentations with uh, uh, PowerPoint slides. Rather, we've asked each of our speakers to reflect on the issues of rebuilding a social contract for about 10 minutes. Then we'll have a conversation amongst ourselves for perhaps another 10 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. For those in the audience, a couple of pointers about uh, uh, how to pose your questions. To, uh, to ask a question, please use the webinars question, Q and A feature, question and answer feature, and type your question on the screen at any time. You will see this feature at the bottom of your screen. Due to time constraints, we may not be able to respond to all of the questions that you ask, and we may try and consolidate some of the questions 
uh, as much as possible if there are multiple versions of a similar question. But we will take the questions and be as full, fulsome as we can be. So with that rather lengthy introduction from me, let's begin. And uh, I would invite Hugh Siegel to make uh, his opening comments. Uh, thank you, Keith. Um, Keith and colleagues, uh, I must say that um, I am not optimistic about our ability as uh, democratic societies, uh, North America, particularly the OECD, to learn from what COVID has shown us and to act with any meaningful dispatch. I, I reflected on the scholarly days of action, which are now underway, uh, I'm very much engaged on, on the issue of anti-racism. And I reflected for a moment on what Martin Luther King said uh, after the um, Voters' Right Act was signed by Lyndon Baines Johnson many decades ago. He made the point, which I thought was very instructive, particularly for our discussion today, that it didn't cost the uh, white majority in, in the United States very much for the Voters' Rights Action, Voters' Right Bill to be signed into law. Um, but it would, it would cost the majority uh, quite a bit if they dealt with the other core issue that was framed by discrimination, namely poverty. And the fact that uh, the vast majority, uh, both in Canada and the United States, the people living beneath the poverty line are people who are uh, black, indigenous, or people of color. And, um, and I think that that is something we have to remember when we agree with enthusiastically the uh, the core premise that black lives matter uh, we also have to say that poor lives matter and sadly uh, the income security system as it has existed across many parts of the oecd to be fair not all but many parts has really not addressed that poor lives matter part of the equation and what we've seen uh, during the covid is the extent to which those people who are either the welfare poor or the working poor have, as you said in your introduction, paid an inordinate price, uh, both in terms of infection and illness and in terms of economic uh, hardship imposed upon them by what we're going through. So the risk we face, I think, is one of a disjuncture between where the public is and where governments appear to be able to situate themselves. Um, when you have a broad consensus in a society uh, about why the pandemic went the way it did, why some people suffered more, and there's a consensus about what should be done to address that issue, and I think in Canada alone and in North America, generally speaking, between 55 and 74 percent of, um, of folks believe that a basic income would be a good reform of the anti-poverty programs to ensure a measure of freedom and choice for low-income people and not just for people who are better off. And governments are unable to act on that either because they're sort of swathed in a kind of evasive incrementalism, which is generated both by civil servants who don't like to make substantial changes and the different interest groups in each country who will argue for and against for various reasons you begin to get a sense on the part of the public that government doesn't actually understand what's happened. It doesn't understand what needs to be done. And when you get that kind of disconnect between the public sentiment and what government is deemed capable of doing, that's when you run into, I think, bouts of extremism on the left or the right and a general kind of anti-government anti bias which gets in the way of the Canadian underlying value of peace, order, and good government. Um, I'm not sure where it fits with the American value of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'll leave that uh, to our colleagues who are either recently from the United States or now resident in the United States. Um, so that's the challenge. The challenge is whether our respective political systems across the OECD can take the learnings which are clear and apparent for example, the one learning which is very clear in Canada, when you look at the demographic maps in every big city of where the COVID virus hit most intensely, who paid the price, both economically and in terms of infection. Um, and, and you look at those maps, 
and you see what has to be done in terms of actually dealing with income uh, insecurity for a, for a portion of the population, which in Canada alone would be in excess of 3.5 million people, with whom, within whom Indigenous and Black and people of colour are wildly overrepresented, and then governments refuse to act, then, of course, uh, you begin to get a sense that whatever the government is about, it's not about the public interest. It's about something else. And that, I think, is a very dangerous disjuncture uh, in terms of the political framework that societies need in order to survive in some kind of coherent way. Um, the other, I guess the other point that I would remind uh, those listening uh, about is that, you know, at, at, at the outset, the Tea Party movement, for example, was really a protest movement about there having been very substantial multi-billion dollar bailouts for corporate America and very little for the middle and working class. That's where it started. And by the time it had built political legs and had all kinds of um, uh, political support from various right-wing financial groups, it became something else. It became a huge stick in the spokes for some of the more progressive things that government tried to do in terms of healthcare and all the rest. So we face those risks. And I think the only way we can be realistic about what the prospects are for making progress is if we are realistic about what those risks are and where we are in that framework. And the one, the one final point I would make is this. I think in Canada, um, we have a federal government which does deserve a tremendous amount of credit. And I say this both regard to the politicians and with regard to the civil servants who worked so hard and so quickly to get emergency funding into place for the eight and a half million Canadians who found themselves out of work one morning through no fault of their own because the economy had to be shut down for public health reasons. But what is interesting about that is that that indicated how insufficient the existing income security infrastructure in the country was. And it indicated how those old systems, EI, uh, employment insurance, or provincial welfare, could not be the vehicles through which that kind of liquidity could be provided to the population. While at the same time, to its credit, the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve was providing immense amounts of liquidity, and I think it was a good thing to do, I'm not opposed to it, to financial markets and to large business in a way that was very substantial and of great value. But the notion of being able to do that for the people at the high end and having no way to do it responsibly for people at the low end, I think produces the kind of division and uh, political uh, intensity, which can be quite problematic. So moving ahead will require us to be frank about what those challenges are. And I think the federal government is trying, as they prepare their throne speech, to figure out where to go. But if they end up only tinkering with EI, with employment insurance, it'll be, if I use the analogy, it's like deciding to paint the house while the basement is on fire. It's not as if painting the house isn't attractive, but it may not have any impact on the fire in the basement. And in my judgment, there is a fire in the basement and something we have to address. So uh, without being uh, too pessimistic, that's my sense of the context we face. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Uh, Deborah, over to you. Wonderful. Um, so thanks you all for being here and, and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, my comments, I was really interested in the idea of the, the social contract. Um, and I don't want to get too theoretical on everyone, but the social contract is, is really important, right? It's the idea that legitimate governments arise when we come together and we choose to enter into this contract amongst ourselves. We give up freedoms in order to allow governments to, to rule over us in, in the name of the common good. And I want to come back to this idea of the common good and what it actually means. Um, but the idea of the social contract really isn't unlike our perceptions of democracy, right? So we think of citizen involvement as being this key component of democracy. Uh, when we engage uh, in democratic processes, uh, the understanding is that we have more of a political voice and that that's good and important. And the liberal democratic face of the state is largely defined by rights representation and participation. 
But I think what COVID uh, has done is, well, it, it's coincided with some of the largest protests we've possibly ever seen. Um, and the, the, the protests against racial injustice and COVID are related, and I wanna kind of contextualize why and, and how. So first of all, as Keith and Hugh mentioned, you know, COVID exposed not just these holes in the social fabric, but actually uh, like gaping chasms. You know, so the, we can talk about the kind of work that was deemed essential, was often low paid and dangerous. Uh, we can talk about the, the precarious nature of the gig economy um, and that emerged not just because of technology, but because people don't have a living wage uh, and needed to supplement their income somehow. We can talk about the precarity of housing for so many people, how many people are teetering on the brink of evictions every month, and our collective unwillingness to let the burden of economic collapse fall on the property owning class. We can talk about the ways that Airbnb markets collapsed and exposed these captured rental markets in, in the heart of our cities. Um, the child care crisis and the gender dimension of, of labor, um, the elder care crisis, uh, the crisis in, in public education, and the fact that I think a number of us in universities were maybe not super incredibly surprised to realize that so many institutions are in fact reliant on the fees from residence halls to just make do. Um, the policy decisions that were made during the crisis were fundamentally about who we thought, who we think we are as, as a country, who deserves to be protected, who should be shown care and, and concern, and who has to make it on their own. Um, and it seems to me that in the crisis, those with wealth and influence went about their lives with fairly little interrupted, and those who do not have wealth and influence were largely forced to pay even when they couldn't. In other words, we know the pandemic did not affect us all equally, not anywhere close to it, in fact. And the hardship fell disproportionately on, as you mentioned, poor people and, of course, communities of color. Um, at the beginning of the, the pandemic, one of the, the catchphrases we heard a lot was, you know, the virus doesn't discriminate. Um, to which the obvious response is, you know, of course it doesn't, but like our healthcare system does, uh, and the structures that we have in place certainly do. Um, so the second point I want to make is, as we're tasked with rethinking the social contract, I want to think about the ways that the social contract has at best ignored and at worst deliberately failed racialized populations. Um, the idea of the social contract, again, we give up our rights for the protection of the state, and in this formulation, the state is this neutral arbiter of power that guarantees the equal treatment and property rights of, of individuals. But Charles Mills, who's a philosopher who's now at CUNY, I think um, he argued 20 years ago that we, we're better off thinking about the social contract, you know, not just as being equally applicable to all people, but in fact, as being a racial contract um, in which uh, there's a set of explicit and tacit agreements uh, of, you know, agreed upon by white people to rule and govern and sub subjugate non-white people. Um, the, ra the racial contract reveals that we're actually not all subject to the same rules in the same way. And of course, it's largely imperceptible to those who benefit the most from it, right? The, one of the great lines in that book is that the fish can't see the water. You know, we can't see the racial contract because it's the environment in which we swim. Um, so instead of thinking about democracy as rights and representation and participation, we need to confront what Joe Sauce and Bessla Weaver call the second face of the state. So we can think here about the activities of governing institutions that are premised on social control and that use different modes of coercion, violence, repression, predation, discipline, uh, against particular populations. And so it's not just that these groups are excluded from democratic politics, rather racialized populations interact with the state pretty regularly, um, but maybe not the arms of the state that wealthier and whiter populations tend to interact with. So there are lots of state citizen encounters um, on, you know, in communities of color with the police, with jails, courts, bail offices in the US, housing authorities, immigration officials, welfare agents, social workers, and tons of other street level bureaucracies that actually work to ensnare 
the poor, the mentally ill, the unhoused, LGBTQ people, indigenous people, and communities of color. And so in fact, maybe the political position of these groups with less access to participations, rights, and representation in the idea of the liberal democratic face of the state is actually a result of too much government engagement in the forms of predation, surveillance, and interference. Um, and a great example is the work of Alexander McClellan and Alex Luscombe, who have been tracking and mapping um, the expansion of police power in Canada under COVID. And their analysis has demonstrated that enforcement uh, in the form of tickets and fines has disproportionately targeted uh, and, and um, um, surveilled indigenous black and homeless populations. Um, so the third and last point I wanna make is that the protests that we've seen over the past hundred days were enabled by circumstances that were put in place by the COVID crisis. And we should see these protests against racial injustice as a demand to renegotiate the social contract on radically different terms. Um, Black Lives Matter has of course been around for quite a while. And the real question I think with these protests is why did white public opinion suddenly change? And it did, you know, white public opinion changed rapidly and, and in support of Black Lives Matter when it had been fairly stagnant for the past few years. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons why um, the protests caught fire. One of course was that the video of George Floyd's murder was pretty incontrovertible. Um, Black Lives Matter had already re, uh, re, um, sorry, created a groundwork and infrastructure to mobilize fairly quickly. Um, the fact that these uh, uprisings started in Minneapolis was really important. There's a long history of radical organizing in Minneapolis. Um, and of course, Philando Castile had been murdered a few years ago in, in that city as well. I think that people on the left were probably a little bit lost following the letdown of the Democratic presidential primary, which had the most diverse most interesting race in history and then ended up with Joe Biden as the nominee. Um, of course, Donald Trump did everything wrong uh, as he always does. Uh, he made the protest against him, uh, sorry, he made the protest about him by threatening to deploy the National Guard, which then drew a line in the sand and just you know, garnered more support for the protests. Um, and of course, COVID was in the mix in that state governors and mayors had already been battling with the federal government and the protests provided them with another opportunity to distinguish their responses from the responses of President Trump. Um, but most fundamentally, I think COVID asked us for individual sacrifice in the name of the common good. We changed our lives for the common good. We sheltered in place, we lost our jobs, our children didn't go to school, we didn't get to bury our loved ones, all in the name of the common good. And then we see this video of a man being tortured by the police for eight minutes and 45 seconds in the name of the common good. And suddenly the common good I think is revealed to be irrevocably, tragically, commonly racist. And for people who had never questioned the nature of our democracy, I think they began to wonder a few things. And so let me end on these questions. Um, one, why is it that our democracy demands extraordinary sacrifice from those citizens who are already lacking in power and resources and who are arguably in the worst position to make those sacrifices? Two, at what point does it become unethical, unjust, and undemocratic to expect citizens to peacefully acquiesce to the terms of the racial contract that they had no part in designing and have limited power to change? Three, is it still more accurate or more appropriate to assume that we need, in order to achieve racial equality, what we actually need is more incorporation into the state? Um, does anyone feel comfortable making the argument that more interaction with the police will actually make black people any safer or make them more fuller participants in democratic society? And um, what if less interaction with the state less interaction with those violent arms of the state is actually the guy, the road to fuller democratic participation for black folks. Fourth, as James Baldwin once asked, is democratic inclusion worth the price of the ticket? Um, what good is integration into an unequivocally racist society? Uh, and why would I want to be integrated into, as Hugh and Dr. King once put it, a burning house? Um, and finally, we need to think carefully about what we mean when we seek a return to normal. 
because the murder of George Floyd was in fact so normal that it happened again to Jacob Blake. Um, police violence is so normal that there have only been three days since George Floyd's murder that the police in the United States have not killed somebody. Um, Deanna, Deanna Brand in the, the Toronto Star had this wonderful article and she asks, who would one have to be to sit in that normal restfully to mourn it or to desire its continuance? And so I think we should view these protests as efforts to renegotiate our normal. Um, and instead of thinking about these protests as being anti-democratic, which some people have accused them of, we should think of them as being radically democratic because democracy is not just based on, on consensus, it's also based on conflict. Um, and perhaps maybe we can think about the protests as a way of developing together a new common good that is fundamentally different than the one that brought us to this circumstance in the first place. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Deb. Uh, I, <clears throat> Irene, I see you're still with us, great. Uh, and over to you. All right, thank you very much, Keith. Um, as Keith mentioned, um, I am sitting in a room looking out a window where the sky is burnt umber and the street lights are still on because even though it's 9.30 Pacific time, it looks like it's 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. It's, it's sort of crazy out here and I'm hoping that our electricity is gonna hold. Um, I want to build on Deborah's comments and really focus on issues related to immigrants and the children of immigrants. Um, so there's definitely overlap uh, with her comments um, to the extent that many, many immigrants are people of color, but there's also some distinction because I'm particularly interested in people who live in places where they are considered foreigners. They're either legally foreigners, they do not have citizenship, or they're perceived in terms of their membership in society as foreigners, regardless of their legal status. Um, and I think the big question that I have in thinking about renegotiating the social contract is who is part of the social contract? Um, and to whom do we owe what? Uh, and so Hugh talked about um, what do we owe to poor people and, and what do they need to have dignity and um, some hope of maybe not even just equal opportunity, but some equality of outcome. And Deborah was speaking about uh, specifically the, the situation of those uh, seen as black or people of color, indigenous people more broadly. Um, and I'm gonna turn the spotlight on, on immigrants and their children. And as many people who are probably listening in know, you know, in Canada, one in five people was not born in the country. And we find even higher percentages of immigrants um, as part of the population in places like Australia and Switzerland, which maybe not is a place that we usually think of as a heavily immigrant country, but is with over a quarter of the population foreign born. Here in the United States where I currently live, 14% uh, of the US population was born um, outside of the country. But in places like California, it's 27% and half of the children in the public schools, K to 12, are either first or second generation immigrants. So no different than many school systems in urban Canada. Um, and so we have this critical issue of social justice within our borders, but then I probably raised just a bigger question, and this is really to whom do we owe what? When we talk about the social contract, the social contract is within the borders of our countries. And so we really care about those within the country. But what do we owe to those outside of the country? Because in a way, where you end up, and especially for those born in Canada, the United States, or other rich OECD countries, people did nothing. There was no merit to where they were born. It was an accident of where their mother just happened to be. Um, and because of that accident of birth, you are channeled after that either into better welfare systems, better legal systems, healthier air, um, or you are channeled into places where your life chances are um, really quite dire. Um, and again, through no fault of your own, just sort of the luck of the draw of, of where you were born. And so I think any conversation about social justice really needs to ask um, whether it is morally legitimate to draw those borders around the sovereign uh, borders of a country um, and to think about uh, social justice maybe more broadly. Now, 
in thinking through the, the, the question of this panel and then what uh, the Queen's International Institute on Social Policy is doing more broadly, if this had, if, well, I mean, they, I guess we did have these, uh, these meetings um, back maybe in the 90s, but if I were speaking back in the 90s, um, there would have been a moment of optimism, I think. With the end of the Cold War, uh, there seemed to be this eclipse of nationalism. People spoke about uh, post-national citizenship or supranational citizenship, cosmopolitanism. There seemed to be the rise of human rights norms in the European Union. You had the rise of uh, institutions, uh, court systems, which were extending uh, protections to people irrespective of their citizenship. So people would be accessing social rights and social benefits, even if they were non-citizens. And there were political rights being given at the local and regional levels, again, without citizenship. So even today, in a place such as Amsterdam or Copenhagen, you can vote at a local election if you have enough years of residence and even despite your non-citizenship. Um, and I would say more generally, based on research um, by a number of different people, we can see that from 1980 through to about 2008, maybe 2016, depends a little bit on, on who you're reading and looking at, there has been this expansion in what I would call um, formal inclusion, especially for those of immigrants uh, background. So there have been more generous rules around territorial citizenship, such that the children of immigrants uh, either have an easier path to citizenship or um, don't have to wait as long. Um, and there's more inclusive naturalization or citizenship acquisition policies. Residence times have been shortened uh, and they've been opened in many, many places. Um, we forget, I think, in North America that um, sort of the birthright citizenship that both Canada and the United States have, where anyone who is born on the territory of Canada or the U.S. are automatically citizens, is not at all the, what happens in the majority of the world. In fact, only about 18% of countries in the world give that kind of territorial citizenship. And so in many, many places, even if you're born the child of immigrants, you're not going to be automatically brought into this formal inclusion. Um, but the policies have become more generous. So if anything, from about 1980 to 2008, there was this expanding circle of membership for those who um, would normally be seen as, as foreigners. Um, and I think there, had, there was also evidence of sort of decreasing social distance. Um, so acknowledging the systemic racism that remains in many, many institutions all over the place, all over the OECD, um, we, had, we have evidence of increasing intermarriage or cohabitation rates, um, more diverse friendship circles, um, at least stated opinion uh, more in favor of equality. The actual reality on the ground is, is a little bit more fraught. But there was evidence of, um, I would say, progress in terms of inclusion. Of course, now the coronavirus pandemic has really laid bare the fragility of this. Um, the fragility in the terms that both Hugh and Deborah were talking about and Keith in his opening remarks in terms of who is hit the hardest. And then also I would say in terms of shutting down borders, hunkering down, and absolutely seeing foreigners as possible vectors of disease. Um, and also uh, sort of animating what had already been a trend of anti-immigrant populist politicians. Um, and so Today, as I, as I speak today, um, that 1990s optimism uh, just feels very quaint. Um, and in fact, if anything, uh, I am feeling very, very pessimistic as someone living in California. And you know, I spent my formative years in Saskatoon, so I've seen some forest fires, um, but nothing like what we're experiencing here. And so when I think about pandemics, it's not just the coronavirus pandemic but we have multiple crises that are layering on top of each other. Um, and I think we're at a real critical point as to whether all those crises are just going to exhaust people um, and make them so scared that they're going to be thinking of their own survival and that of their family, or whether there is a moment of collective change possible. And so when I think about the current crises, I think about the immediate one in terms of health, related to coronavirus and the immediate problem of economic recession also related to the virus. Um, but then we have sort of this medium term growing problem of inequality 
and the sense of a win or lose economy. And again, living here in the Bay Area, this is uh, flagrantly uh, visible and might be a warning sign for other places. So this is the place where people can become millionaires overnight when an IPO uh, makes the next app and all of its developers really, really rich. But also when I drive uh, into Berkeley along the freeway, I see homeless encamp encampments all along the highway. So you see people living in tents and this has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger over the, this, the years that I've been living here. Um, we also have, I would say, this medium term growing issue of populism where the political answers to our problems are uh, supposedly um, related to having uh, a male uh, single leader who is going to solve all of our problems in the simplest ways possible through simple slogans and one or two syllable words. Um, and that is not just the United States, but we see it in a number of different countries. And then we have these long-standing problems that we have really not made very much headway with at all. One of them is the racial hierarchies that are baked into our institutions, which Deborah has already talked about. And the other one is climate change. Um, and clearly climate change yeah. is going to be exacerbating. Okay. So we have these problems of um, climate change as well, where everything is gonna get harder. I mean, it's very hard to provide citizens or non-citizens with basic goods, um, with food, with healthcare, with uh, you know, reasonable accommodations, when there are fires in your back doors, hurricanes knocking everything down, tornadoes ripping roofs off, and then just the general increase in temperature, which is gonna make it much harder to grow your crops and for the power grid to stay in place. Um, and so unfortunately, I really find myself in a pretty pessimistic moment. And so when we think about how can we move beyond this, how could we renew the social contract? Um, one touchstone that I think people often talk about is World War II and the years after World War II. And I, I think if I ask myself whether that is um, an example to be followed, and I hope not. I mean, I really don't want the world to go back into a major conflagration um, in order to build a sense of we-ness and a sense of solidarity. And it strikes me that World War II was different because there was a singular external enemy, at least for Canada and the United States. Um, it, was, it was a clear enemy and the sort of goals were very uh, evident. People came together either on the home front or as they were fighting uh, overseas. And then when the GIs came home in the United States, there was a sense that they were owed something. I will add the footnote, however, that who was owed what definitely was distinguished by race. Uh, white GIs and uh, got um, access to cheap mortgages. They got all kinds of benefits. They got to go to college on the government dime. Uh, black veterans did not often benefit from those uh, social policies. But there was a sense that there, there was something owed. So today, the question is, what is the problem? Well, there's multiple ones. Who's at fault? Some of these questions are so big, it's hard. Like, Who's at fault for a coronavirus? It's a virus. It's, it's just part of the world. What about climate change? Clearly humans are at fault, but we can't easily identify a single enemy that we can rally together and fight against. It's ourselves that we have to rally. Um, so I think it makes this much, much more difficult uh, in terms of who the we is with whom we have solidarity and how do we create solidarity to tackle these uh, issues. So when I think about mechanisms of change, and this will sort of be my final remarks. And I think back to how change has come about previously. One is clearly voting. Um, and here I point out that at least in North America, non-citizens do not have formal franchise. And so it's extremely hard for people who are non-citizens to be um, seen as part of the social contract or to have their voice uh, in those debates if they don't have access to the franchise, if they can't actually cast a ballot, or if they cannot run for office until they have citizenship. And we might want to ask questions about whether that is just to require some legal paperwork when people are clearly affected by the laws of government. So if you're affected by the laws of government, shouldn't you 
have the right and maybe the obligation to also have voice um, in that decision making. Uh, second, we've made change because of protest. And so here I build on Deborah's comments, which, with which I really agree. Um, in 2006, millions of immigrants in the United States took to the streets to oppose a very draconian immigration bill that would have made being undocumented a criminal offense. Um, and anyone who helped someone who was undocumented would uh, be potentially accused of a felony. Um, and so people took to the streets then. But in 2006, there was a sense that it was potentially safe to go to the streets, even if one was undocumented. In the current moment, I don't think any non-citizen is feeling particularly safe. And so it's not clear that protest, especially for foreigners or people who are seen as foreigners, is a way forward. And here I would emphasize that you don't necessarily just have to be a non-citizen, but if you're perceived as a non-citizen. So Keith made mention of how um, some people associate the coronavirus uh, with China and are using that as a way to vilify a particular group. If you're of Chinese background or you're seen as of East Asian background, you are gonna be much more afraid to take to the streets um, in this current climate because of this sense of illegitimacy. And some of my research has been looking at how people can frame their legitimacy and their ability to claim um, social benefits or social rights. So we ask ordinary Californians whether various types of people, black, white, Mexican-American, or an undocumented Mexican, should be able to access uh, food support, so food stamps in the United States, or get uh, help with health care if they're uninsured. And if you make an appeal to human rights, which we had expected would make people more generous, more likely to extend that social safety net, um, we find that it really doesn't move people at all. Um, and interestingly, it was actually making an appeal to American values that made California registered voters more likely to be generous, even to an undocumented immigrant, which we did not expect. So it does suggest that there is something to a nationalistic call to the we that could make, make people more generous, even to non-citizens. And, and I think we really need to think about that because I personally was not expecting it. And I would guess now that that would also work in Canada. There's a study that I'm currently doing with some collaborators in Canada where we're seeing whether the same thing occurs. But I believe I'm hypothesizing that if you make an appeal to Canadian values, people will also be somewhat more generous, even to immigrants, even to non-citizens. Um, but it does raise this question, though, of like, where, where does that line stop? Where does the social contract end? And then two final points in terms of thinking about change and renewing the social contract. Um, one would be the side of the public, so voting and protest. The other side, I think, is political leadership in the civil service, which people have spoken about. Um, here, living in the United States and looking at the dynamics of what happens under COVID and also around immigration, you cannot escape the conclusion that political leadership matters. Um, political scientists endlessly debate whether public opinion follows or leads what politicians do. The answer is probably a bit of both, but clearly political leadership matters because when you have people at the very highest office who say egregious, racist, xenophobic things, it opens up a space for um, a small minority of the population to feel embodied, emboldened to perpetuate hate crimes and to do some very dangerous things as I think we're currently seeing in the United States. Um, so one thing that I think is absolutely critical is that political leaders really do need to articulate an inclusive sense of the social contract and who we are, because absent that, I think we are in very dangerous territory. And then last, I would, I would call out the civil service. Um, Hugh uh, mentioned uh, that in terms of poverty relief, there might be a public desire for change, but sometimes bureaucracies turn to incrementalism. When it comes to immigration, and I think I'm very much um, affected by the current moment, I think incrementalism is really good. Um, I think that uh, absent public bureaucracies, the whiplash that we're getting on some of the immigration matters, especially in the United States, would have been even worse, but it's really, really bad, so maybe it doesn't matter as much.
But when I think about what's different between Canada and the United States, I'm very much struck that the public service is, is, has a different feel and it has a different culture. Um, I would say that in the Canadian case, uh, the, the public service's dedication and their professionalism and their sense of public mission is a key strength for Canada. And um, if I were to make recommendations, I would say that uh, governments, both at the federal, but also maybe the provincial and municipal level, should continue to invest in hiring people with that sense of public mission and that professionalism um, in order to sort of keep the, the institutions of government strong. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank, <clears throat> thanks to all three of you. There's uh, three very challenging views <clears throat> and occasionally an optimistic uh, sliver um, to the conversation. So <clears throat> I'd like to start with one or maybe two questions of my own and then uh, turn over to uh, the questions which are building up uh, from the participants in the webinar. So let me start um, by saying, by asking <clears throat> whether or not you think that the impact of the pandemic is going to be quite, is quite different in different countries. So <clears throat> the Pew Research uh, or Survey Research Group did a survey of <clears throat> a variety of countries asking the question, underlying question was, is this pandemic pulling people together or is it reinforcing divisions, right? That was the essential question. If you look at the superficial, at least, level of uh, public debate in Canada, I cannot remember a period of greater consensus. The consensus is up until now has been multi-party and the consensus has been federal provincial which we don't often see we are in this strange slightly strange certainly unusual consensual moment so the question is is that an advantage if one one is trying to move forward on some of these issues or not <clears throat> is this exceptional and as soon as we start to move towards major changes, which will be long term and could not be justified exclusively in terms of fighting the pandemic, they might be responses to problems revealed or highlighted by the pandemic, but they might not be actually defense, defensible in terms of this is, a, we need this now for the pandemic. This is actually a long term improvement in the sort of social contract. Is the kind of quiet, political quiet that I sense in this country at the moment an optimistic sign? Or would it dissolve quickly if governments actually tried to take up any of the kinds of big, bold initiatives that uh, you have spoken about? I don't know who to start. Does anyone want to start with that question? Hugh, well, we could just go in the normal order, I guess. Well, let me just say, Keith, that uh, I really believe that you have accurately described the level of consensus between federal and provincial governments in Canada during this period of time. And the consensus has not just been around the need for collective action in terms of prophylactic health engagement uh, and all the other things that were necessary to flatten the curve and to keep, keep the process manageable. It was also in terms of the fact that governments, federal and provincial, to the best of their ability, engaged quickly to deal with the economic risk people were facing. Catastrophic economic risk. So that's what we have to understand what the consensus is. So I think the risk is not that the consensus will come apart if governments continue to try to do that in a way that deals with the underlying issues uh, that helped produce the unfairness in the pandemic, I think the consensus will come apart if governments say, okay, we've solved that problem back to normal. The minute governments start to try to go back to what they view as normal, which is the old normal, which was tolerant of massive economic exclusion for a large part of our population, racialized and otherwise, that was um, 
completely uh, bureaucratically excessive in terms of how low-income people were handled without any perception that they deserve the same freedom to make decisions about their lives as people who are better off. If you see government revert to that old normal, then I think the consensus will come apart, and it'll come apart very quickly. Uh, but if government says, okay, this is what we did with the resources we had, here's where we now need to go, and we now know because of COVID, we've now seen when the tide went out, who wasn't wearing any bathing trunks, we have to engage on that, we have to gain, engage on that file, then I think the consensus will be substantial. Um, and uh, so I'm optimistic that if government has that kind of courage, the consensus will stay. But if government begins to go back to ideological divisions or, you know, poverty, the poor will always be with us, that kind of aphoristic insanity, then I think you'll see the consensus come apart. And it may not come apart in peaceful ways. It may come apart in ways that are, are truly, truly problematic. Deb, do you want to go next on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really great, great question. Um, I'm always skeptical of consensus. Uh, and as you know, I'm always skeptical of public opinion surveys. Um, and I wonder, you know, I think I think Hugh's right in that there's a difference between, you know, the public offering uh, a broad consensus about how we that 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 we're all in crisis right now, and what whether or not that consensus is able to uh, ignite government action that would then like continue um, a kind of um, consensus ar around the, the appropriateness of that action. And I think we've seen that with these calls to, you know, in my research area and in these calls to defund the police, you know, because it seems that defunding the police and the abolitionist movement has gained much more traction among the general public as, you know, as it, you know, in the past few months, as it has in the past 20 years. Um, and yet, uh, when it come, when push comes to shove, you know, when Toronto City Council is faced with proposals to actually reallocate some of the funds that the Toronto Police Services gets, like they, they kind of hunkered down and gave them more money, you know, rather than defunding the police. So, so you know, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure that consensus always necessarily leads to change. And I think that uh, this points, for me, the, the most, one of the most interesting things um, about these crises have been the ways in which, you know, in, this really has laid bare the, the role of institutions. You know, federalism, obviously, incredibly important, um, but also the, like, other policies uh, that really do um, create different circumstances in, in different places. Like those matter, like the, the, the fact that Americans uh, most frequently get their health insurance through their employers, like matters a, a lot. And then the economy fell off a cliff and everyone, this is, everyone lost their health insurance uh, because many of people were, were laid off. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure, I'm just not sure about that consensus will always lead to, to action and that the action that governments choose to do will then reify or even be aligned with the, the consensus that precipitated it. Okay, uh, Irene, anything to add on this one? If not, I, I can ask yeah, another one. Let me just say, I think, there's, I think there's two important things. I think there's the issue of trust and trust in institutions and or the democratic process. Um, and then I, I agree with Deborah. I, I'm, I believe that change happens less through consensus than through conflict and engagement. Um, I think the the history of Canadian healthcare, uh, universal healthcare, is a really great example of a lot of conflict and a lot of fighting. Um, but now it's considered one of the things that makes Canada Canada. If you look at opinion surveys about what people in Canada are most proud of. It's healthcare, um, and you know, in part, it's because it makes them not American, because uh, it's always nice, I think, as Canadians, not to be American. And healthcare is a good way to show that you're you're not American. Um, but those institutions lay the groundwork for some level of trust, and I think the the problem in the United States right now is that it is so highly partisan. There is so little trust on either side 
um, in each other that, that there is there, there's not much of a sense of where um, the end point is whereas I mean I think all of you who are currently living in Canada we're better positioned to speak on this than I but I, I feel when I speak to people and I look at some of the opinions surveys in Canada there's a sense that maybe I don't agree with the government in office and and I have different viewpoints but my view will at least be heard and considered um, generally speaking I mean I think there's 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 obviously people who might not feel that but there's much more of a sense that I will be heard um, than currently. And so that is, that is critical. And I do think it is based on institutions um, where people feel that they have a fair shot, be it in the Canadian education system, um, which is decent and largely public, including at the university level, be it through healthcare in the United States. Um, the privatization of, of so much of this makes people really feel that they have to rely only on themselves and so then it becomes much more an us versus them mentality. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I have a number of other questions I had planned, <clears throat> but just a second. I think I should move um, to uh, <clears throat> questions from the audience because there's a fair number of them. <clears throat> Some of them you may have uh, touched on already. But let me just um, <clears throat> take the first two. The first question is, <clears throat> what will it take, if not a virus pandemic, to get conti past continual government tinkering and incrementalism that Senator Siegel noted as the bane of policy innovation? If the pandemic is not the catalyst, what else possibly could prompt radical social policy design? Redesign, sorry. So you've, you've covered this a bit, but go for it. And we don't have to follow the traditional order, although Hugh, you're mentioned explicitly in this question. Well, look, um, my view is that if we do not see government acting coherently based on the learnings from the COVID experience and the extent to which the COVID experience was layered upon huge inequalities in our society to begin with, then I think you will see the kind of public reaction which will produce political instability in various jurisdictions, which may in fact produce governments that will be radically committed to going in one direction or another. That's the door we open if the existing political process appears not to understand what has happened during the COVID and anti-racism framework that we've just gone through. Because I think what, what is clear to, is that the public understands it. And the public is very concerned about the need to take on certain substantive changes. And if government shows that it's prepared to move in that direction, something other than incrementally, but in some ways and make a huge difference relatively quickly, I think our cohesion will, will stay together. But if government appears to be whistling through the graveyard on this, then I think we'll begin to see some political instability of all kinds in the streets and elsewhere, which could be deeply problematic. And that may then finally say to government, as was the case with the United Farmers Party and the progressives in the West after the depression, the time has come to make some fundamental change. So whether we have to go through that bump and grind will depend upon whether those presently in government actually see what's going on and respond appropriately. So, so I would interpret that <clears throat> as a relatively optimistic scenario for long-term change. If it doesn't happen now, it, there will be a blow up and it will happen. So <clears throat> I had a sense that both Deborah and uh, Irene were perhaps a little less optimistic. So do you want to pick up on, on the question and Hugh's initial commentary? Uh, sorry, uh, Deborah, we'll not as well keep to the order. Yeah, I mean, so I think that the increment, the incremental nature of change is in part, you know, it's because in political science, we know that change is rare and slow and, and frequently incremental. Um, but it's also, it's also because policies are complicated and, and layered, right? And so, so for example, to give the example again of defunding the police, defunding the police, probably a good idea, in my opinion. Um, but that's just like one small part of a much larger structure that Michelle Alexander has called the, the new Jim Crow. Uh, 
right? So if we fix, say, say in some imaginary world, we fix policing, great, amazing. Um, and we still, what we still have is the cash bail system. We still have uh, overcharging from prosecutors. We still have uh, um, jur all white juries in a lot of cases. We still have judges and, and being hampered uh, by three strikes laws. We still have um, the, the system of um, labeling people as felons, which then limits their ability to access housing and food and licensing and, and, and certain professions, right? So like when I work with my students to kind of map out the system of, of criminal justice, criminal punishment, um, policing is important, you know? And so changing uh, the nature of policing is crucial, but there's a whole, you know, there's, there's a, it's anchored by more than policing the system that is fundamentally um, unequal and ends up targeting disproportionately people of color, black people, indigenous people. So, you know, so it's not that I, I don't wanna be a naysayer, but these, these, these things are complicated and so easy and quick and kind of singular solutions will never end up amounting to radical social change because these, these problems are, are too complex for that. Irene, anything to add? I'm, I'm actually a fan of incrementalism. I, I figure if you are the tortoise and you slowly make progress, at least you're gonna hopefully get to some kind of finish line. Um, you know, it's not very satisfying, um, but I do think that that's actually how policy and politics works. Um, I've, I've noticed that in, in thinking through incrementalism though and radical change, I've, I've noticed that a few of the questions coming in have um, raised the issue about whether the United States should even be part of this conversation if most of the people listening in are concerned about Canadian policy. Um, and you know, maybe De Deborah could speak to this too, but as someone who has lived on both sides of the border and, and is an observer on both sides, um, I think that there are things Canada can learn or Canadians can learn from the conversation on race in the United States. I think that Canadians like to believe that things are way worse in the US than Canada, which then maybe gives them an out on some of these issues. And objectively, there are things that are much worse in the United States. And then I would maybe point out to the situation of indigenous in Canada. Um, I see very big parallels to some of the issues facing black people in the US mm -hmm. and um, some of the things facing indigenous people. And if anything, when you look at things like mortality rates, suicide rates, uh, abuse by police and such, the situation of indigenous people in Canada is even worse. And so I do think that um, there, there is value in thinking through some of the challenges the US is facing, even for a Canadian audience. So I was going, that was the next question I was gonna ask. One of the questions from the audience touches on that. Could you comment on contemporary differences in systematic racism between Canada and the United States, this panel seems especially well qualified to address this issue. So uh, Irene has opened the question. I, I suspect we could go the reverse order here. Deborah may have some thoughts, then, then Hugh. Deborah may have some thoughts. <laughs> Deborah has many thoughts on this. <laughs> Um, you know, I've spent my career studying the, the differences in systemic racism between Canada and the U.S. And, you know, there, as Irene said, I want to do a hard agree with Irene. There are real similarities, particularly if you're looking at the criminal justice system, with, you know, in which Black people are 3.5% of the Canadian population and around 9 or 10% of the federally incarcerated population. Indigenous people are 4% of the Canadian population and 25% of the federally incarcerated population, right? So we... We have very similar stats. If you look at, at basically any socioeconomic indicator, we see real disparities um, that are fundamentally racialized. Um, and, and the Canadian, uh, the tendency of Canada to compare ourselves to, to the United States um, in order to, to make claims about how not racist Canada is, just, you know, it's just totally inaccurate. Um, one of the differences which you know Keith and I have been talking about now for years is that the, the policy architecture in Canada was largely put in place. So thinking about the immigration policy, thinking about the major components of the welfare state, these policies were put in place when Canada was not nearly as racially diverse as it is now, right? So between 1960s and 1980s, this policy architecture was put in place. 
you look at the 1981 census, Canada is like 96% white, right? So it's, and Canada doesn't start getting more diverse until the, the 80s and 90s. Um, whereas in the United States, you always have this 12, 13% of the population that's African American and the policies or lack thereof largely reflect white Americans' unwillingness to put mechanisms into place that would be redistribut redistributive from you know, the pockets of white Americans to non-white others. And so the main difference here um, is, is historic, it's contextual, uh, but racism absolutely exists in Canada. And in some ways, the United States does a better job at, for example, collecting racial data so we actually know the extent of racism in the United States. And Canada could, could learn a few lessons from that. Hugh, do you want to add? Well, I, let me just say that um, for those who don't live in Kingston, uh, between downtown Kingston and the Burbs, uh, we have seven federal or provincial prisons. And 80% uh, of the, uh, what I like to refer to the guests of Her Majesty in those prisons, come from the 10% of the population who live beneath the poverty line. And the vast majority of them are people who happen to be racialized. So our prison system has been, in a sense, one of the places in which the lack of coherent poverty abatement policies and equality of opportunity has ended up being the reservoir, if you wish, of the people who end up going through the justice system and other issues uh, for reasons that um, are often driven by, uh, by poverty and the circumstances that poverty produces. And we know, and the numbers are clear, that people who live beneath the poverty line have much worse health outcomes. They actually live 10 years less than people who are better off. We know that they have far worse educational outcomes for their children. And they, uh, then there's a propensity to have greater difficulty with substance abuse and with the wrong side of the law. So um, the reality for us is not that we haven't been as frank about racism as we need to be, although we haven't been. It's because we've addressed it in other ways. And I think one of the great benefits of the Black Lives Matter movement now and, uh, and what has happened since the tragic death uh, by a police officer of, of, that, of, that, of, of that American black person is that people are now beginning to understand how the two issues connect. And that I think is a tremendous opportunity because if you think about our electoral context, um, all of our major political parties now are not dependent upon what happens in the inner cities, which by the way, tend to be wealthier than the burbs. Uh, they're dependent upon what happens in the outside regions, which tend to be far more diverse and have a much more diverse population in terms of both race and color and faith and background. So all the political parties are going to be faced with the need to address that issue in a credible way and not just with empty symbolism and uh, cheery, uh, cheery uh, calls for a better tomorrow. People are going to know what you're doing today to make it better. And I think that's a good pressure to have on the political system. Okay, I have uh, another question which takes off from the kind of discussion that's been going on here, but, uh, but uh, has a nice, uh, sort of focus to it. <clears throat> so the, the question reads as follows. How do people living in long-term care fit into an evolving vision of the common good or contract? And the point they make, the, the premise here, is that given the emphasis in our conversation, this is a group who might not have access to the tools of protest and engagement and which younger Canadians might not immediately value. So we have a, a, a very vulnerable community. And if progress comes through conflict and process, not consensus and humanitarian values, our people in long-term care who were some of the most vulnerable throughout the pandemic, are they just toast? That, that, that's my version of the question. That's not the version that came from the audience, which was much more civilized. So come on, all well, your conflict people. Well, I will, I will, let me, I'll say briefly that, of course, the, the folks who lived in long-term care uh, 
and who were tragically lost during the pandemic were not lost because of anything they did. They were lost in large measure because the terms by which the operators, both public and private of those facilities, were allowed to operate, the um, extent to which low income uh, uh, working poor people were the employees, in fact, who had to work in more than one place in order to make any kind of a living, had no benefits, had no sick leave. And then as they moved from place to place to make a living became innocent vectors of the disease, indicates, in my view, a very clear path for what all of us should be demanding of government in terms of the regulatory frame and the penalties for people who aren't prepared to make the changes necessary to keep those folks safe. Because whether we like it or not, we're all going to have people in our families who end up in those facilities. We may end up in those facilities ourselves in some years' time. And we all have an interest, just as we do in, for hospitals and schools, in a regulatory frame which protects not just those who are wealthy and can afford 10000 a month, but those who need to be in a facility for a whole bunch of substantial reasons and are of more modest means. And that regulatory frame is something which I think Canadians will push for. And I don't think that um, the fact that the folks who live in those facilities are seniors and may not be as engaged in public debate as one would hope should limit our capacity to get it right and get it right fast. Deborah or uh, Irene? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's a great question. And it, um, to me, it, it brings to light the ways in which, you know, so I made the argument that protests can be considered radically democratic, right? And, you know, I've been, uh, there's a, a great book that I read recently was Astra Taylor's Democracy May Not Exist, uh, But We'll Miss It When It's Gone. And she looks at, um, and then she calls them democratic tensions. Uh, and she tries to reimagine um, what we mean when we say democracy and really combine that with um, you know, a, a more robust sense of, of equality. And so in meaning that maybe you know, one, one person, one vote isn't actually the most democratic system um, that we can think of. You know, she uh, raises questions about you know, why is it that um, people who are, are older have the same vote as people who are, are younger, even when the, the young people will be living with the consequences of these decisions for much longer than those who are older. Um, and so, the, you know, the situation, the question to me brings to mind the ways in which protest is fundamentally inaccessible for entire communities. And Irene had mentioned, you know, undocumented people probably don't feel particularly safe going to protest, particularly because, you know, the police, you know, police have been doing what police do at these protests, which is arresting people. And that can lead to um, an incredible vulnerability for undocumented people. Um, people in long-term care facilities obviously can't access protests in the same way. Protests are frequently inaccessible for people, um, differently abled people, right? So um, I think that protests, um, even as I believe that they are uh, an attempt to rethink what we mean by, by democracy, they can't be the, the be all and end all. Um, you know, there have to be other modes of participation uh, that um, people who have different needs and, and people with different access to power can still use to manifest and realize change. Irene, anything about the powerless? I would add two things when we're thinking about the social contract and, and re renegotiating it is what are the solidarities or tensions or the cohesion and tensions between generations and then also the role of women's care work in in keeping those generations knitted. Um, it, it strikes me that the the people who were obviously directly the most hurt and, and who, who, who died because of this pandemic were older people, especially in care homes. But the other group, I think, who is feeling extremely vulnerable right now are quite younger people who are being denied the schooling that they were accept, expecting, whether it's in the K-12 system or if they're now going on to university and they're looking forward, if they're you know, getting ready to go into the labor market, they're hitting a labor market that is 
unfathomable in terms of job prospects. And my sense is that people, younger people, just feel like the, the social safety net is not going to be there for them. They, they know the demographics, they know the aging population, they know the cost of health care, uh, and they are fundamentally scared in a way of what is going to be left for them, how much of their tax dollars will be going to different generations. And, and I think one of the dangers heading forward, if we don't have enough of them, um, is, is this generational, you know, who's getting what or who's going to have to pay for what. And I would just make the comment that in the past, women's care work was so central to that. So in terms of the voiceless, women who took care of elderly relatives or women who took care of children could potentially have somewhat of a voice, uh, probably not protest, but at least could show up at school board meetings or could show up and, and you know, talk to people. Um, but one of the things that has happened as, as sort of workforce participation of women has increased and young people's, uh, young women's views of what their future is going to be probably involves work much more than homemaking, um, is that you then have to either turn to government or the private sector. And then I just think that gets exacerbated by social inequalities because those with money can turn to the private sector and get the $10,000 a month uh, fancy care home that Hugh mentioned and others then have very little else to turn to. And that is, that is where we have historically wanted government to help. Um, back in the day, way back in the day, it would have been religious institutions. It would have been the Catholic Church or it would have been other religious faith institutions that, that provided those services. Um, so, you know, this is something we're going to have to think about in the future. Okay, well, um, then um, let me see if I can uh, slip in a question which I warn the panelists I might ask. <clears throat> that is, um, <clears throat> we've covered a lot of territory so far, uh, <clears throat> and we have a number of public officials who are, you know, the Irene's public servants who, in her view, uh, are more committed to a common mission than, um, well, are committed to a common, more, po uh, more committed to a common public mission than perhaps elsewhere. So um, let's assume you're, you're, you have a magic moment and you can provide advice to the sen most senior levels of the Canadian government. What advice would you give them about moving forward? <coughs> now, to some extent, we've covered this, but put it quite explicitly. What are the sources of support for change? What how could one, how could they mobilize support for change? What are the barriers they might face? What are the priorities that in your mind they should adopt? Incrementalism, I think there's a disagreement amongst the panelists on the, the adequacy of incrementalism. So this is one <laughs> final shot at senior government. What do you say? You, do you want to start? We'll keep the order. I we really locked into it. Well, I would keep my advice um, simple. Uh, I would say play to your strength. And your strength was your ability to turn on a dime at the beginning of the pandemic, to provide through the Canada Revenue Agency, rapid liquidity for people whose income evaporated overnight through no fault of their own. Uh, people were able to file uh, on CRA uh, on a Monday and the money was in their bank account by Wednesday. There is no employment insurance program, no provincial welfare program that has that level of acuity or rapid turnaround. That is a huge strength for which our senior public service deserves immense credit, both for design and implementation. Don't set that aside as a once in a lifetime mistake. Embrace it as something which should now define how you go forward in the coming throne speech proposals and budget to say, we have learned from that. We understand what the problems really are. And here's how we're gonna move in the same spirit to address them directly and appropriately in the broad interest of the Canadian public. That's what they should do. Nothing more and nothing less. Okay, Deborah. I mean- Your moment with the prime minister. Oh, we'd have some words. 
um, I, you know, I think that um, I think that Canadian um, policymakers do not necessarily have a good handle on what systemic racism is. You know, I think that uh, we tend to think about racism as being these individual behaviors, these abhorrent individual behaviors. Um, but it's actually um, a system, it's a system of, of power and domination. And so the idea of, you know, structural racism, you know, isn't that there are a bunch of racists that work in, in government and therefore that's why policies end up having racialized consequences. You know, the idea of systemic racism is that if there were, if there were no racists working in the government, we would still, you know, institutions would still create circumstances of racial inequality. And I think that, you know, the most immediate uh, concern for me at this point is like we don't have good data. We don't have good racial data. Um, and I think it's partially there's a real hesitancy to collect race based data in uh, certainly in Quebec, where I live, um, and, and I think across the country as well. Um, because I think we, again, have a, a, a backwards understanding of, of racism. So like talking about race and collecting racial data, that in and of itself isn't racist. It's actually the only way that we'll be able to determine the extent uh, of the damage that has been done by COVID uh, and hopefully create policies to, to uh, address it. Irene, your moment with the Prime Minister. Well, okay, so I, I believe in incrementalism, but hey, if I could be radical, I would say definitely raise the tax rate on the richest. Um, I think inequality has been rising and I think that in general public opinion favors taxing those who have really benefited from technological change and, and sort of the, the change in the economy. And then um, I'm, I'm on board with you, a guaranteed minimum income. I think that's a great idea. Um, so, you know, I think, I think my, my aspirations would be very radical. I don't know if we could do that, but if the prime minister would like to stake his political reputation on that, I'd say go for it. Um, I would say another thing, which maybe we don't think about as much, and this comes directly from my research with immigrant communities uh, in Canada and the United States, and especially in Canada. Um, I think that there is, there is a lot of benefits for public-private partnerships. Um, there are problems with public-private partnerships because when you use grants and contracts to provide services at the local community level, Sometimes those local community organizations are not particularly sophisticated. Sometimes there's some, um, you know, some inefficiencies and such. And th there can be benefits to having government provide services. But one of the huge advantages of doing public-private partnerships along a range of issues is that the local community organizations can then somewhat craft um, the implementation of policy to the local needs of the community. So what it works in La Ranche, Saskatchewan will not work necessarily in Kingston or in Toronto. Um, and I think there's huge benefit for having that. And then also you build civic capacity. So when you have governments that provide grants and contracts to do social services at a local level, those social service organizations help build leadership capacity and constituents that then can mobilize um, and give voice to those who need those services. And so if we're thinking about the voiceless and the poor that Hugh started us off with, um, when they are somewhat organized because they have a link to a community-based organization, when cuts come or challenges come, they have a mechanism by which they can make their voices heard. Um, so I guess my second recommendation beyond tax the rich and, and do guaranteed minimum income would be think very carefully through better public-private partnerships that local services can be attentive to local needs, but also build civic capacity to then give voice when the need arises. Okay, well, <clears throat> well that picks up, um, Irene's last comments picked up on one question that was asked by the audience, which uh, <clears throat> I didn't get squeeze in, which was that uh, if the state institutions are failing, is there a way towards more pluralism in the interactions with uh, and, and sort of institutional context within which people operate? So I'm glad you ended on that note. I mean, someone's very persistent. I don't know how to turn off my phone. Sorry. Uh, um, um, so <laughs> moment of distraction. Uh, uh, our time is now uh, basically over. 
So it remains only for me to thank you for having uh, participated today and for taking part in what I have found at least a really rich and fascinating conversation. Um, it's been instructive and it's not always been optimistic, <clears throat> but it's had its optimistic moments. And um, with that, um, I thank you all for taking this on. I have a couple of closing remarks. I just want to thank, <clears throat> not only thank our um, uh, speakers, but also say a bit about our final session. <clears throat> the next session of the series focuses on the issues of public opinion, the attitudes of Canadians and uh, people in other countries. How have their, their attitudes changed during the pandemic? How have their priorities changed during the pandemic? How have levels of trust been affected during the pandemic? Uh, what are the implications of shifts in public attitudes uh, during the pandemic for governance, for building back better? For that topic, we have two great presenters. One is Ben Page, who's the chief executive at Ipsos Mori in the UK. He'll be speaking from London and will be drawing on comparative analysis on these sorts of questions. <clears throat> Secondly is David Coletto, who's the chief executive officer at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Abacus Data here in Canada. Um, our moderator will be Jennifer Ditchburn, who is the editor of Policy Options, the electronic journal of the Institute for Research and Public Policy. I think it's gonna be a great session. And uh, although Deborah may not be the biggest fan of public opinion data, some of us, uh, some of us find it helpful. So uh, two great speakers and an interesting session on which to end the series. Please note, please note, we have a, a, an announcement about the final session. It will not take place tomorrow, Thursday as advertised. It is being shifted to Friday. It will happen this Friday, <coughs> excuse me, this Friday, September the 11th, starting at 12 o'clock, our normal start time. So please join us. Please use the unique URL that you received in your confirmation email and that you've been using for joining the other sessions in the series. And before finally closing, I would like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, Employment and Social Development Canada, the Ministry of Children, Community Services and Social Services in Ontario and the City of Toronto. Without their support, we would not be able to bring together such a rich conversation about the future of Canadians and, and international social policy in the contemporary period. So thanks to them. Okay, until Friday then, stay safe and we'll see you then. Thank you again, bye-bye. <laughs>